So I'm uh, excited to um, introduce Dr. Yusuf Yazdi. He's the executive director of the Center for Bioengineering and Innovation and Design, CBID, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he's been there for about 12 years, serves as the program director also of the Johns Hopkins Coulter Translational Partnership, and has faculty appointments in both bioengineering and um, the School of Business. Prior to Hopkins, he was at uh, Johnson & Johnson, where he served as the corporate director for science and technology, um, has his uh, PhD from uh, bioengineering from UT Austin and also an MBA from Wharton. So I got that off, off of uh, the internet that we um, rely on for all fact. So I might have missed something, um, Yousef, but I'll give you the floor to um, make any corrections and additions and then uh, present about your work at, at Hopkins. Well, thank you so much, Professor Perlman. It's really an honor to speak to you all today. Thank you for the invitation. I look forward to having a great discussion. I think that intro was perfect. Um, and uh, uh, really, the, it, it's, the important part is that what we've tried to do here at Johns Hopkins CBID is bring some best practices from industry into academic-based innovation. And some of the, the lessons learned from late stage failures in industry and try to make that into a curriculum that would teach students to be better at this front end early stage innovation process. So um, I'll try to talk for like 30 minutes if I, but I've been here for now 12 years. So my length of my presentation has gotten longer and longer. I think just an academic disease that we can't, we can't do and say anything briefly and concisely, but, um, but I'll try. And I really look forward to your feedback and I'd love to hear your, your frank feedback on our process, on the way we're doing things, any suggestions you have. Um, the program we have here at, at Hopkins is really based on the insights actually started in Pittsburgh at the BME, um, uh, BMES meeting. My first year here at Hopkins, the BMES meeting was at Pittsburgh and there was, in a, there was a program called BME IDEA which brought together all the innovation and design programs in BME in one place. And basically we learned so much from our peers at other, other programs. And we'd love to help other programs as much as we can to share what we do and help, help anybody else interested in developing a program like this. Um, the, the, the program has two mission, uh, a dual mission. Believe it or not, this was country. This was really, um, a, you know, uh, uh, a bit, uh, you know, of a, of a controversy. That our mission is really about education and, and development of people, of students, which of course is part of the university, but also this idea that the mission of the center is also about the healthcare solutions they develop, and we care about both of those, and uh, we care about the impact that both of those has. That's the, really the main metric of our success. Um, both the trajectory of the graduates of the program and the trajectory of the solutions they come up with. And both of those are things we, met, we measure ourselves against. Um, education in the form of classroom education and teaching um, principles and processes, etc. But we also care about their development as professionals. So we try to encourage that um, we try to make the year kind of like a one year startup um, experience. I love this photograph because it's um, it's uh, some of our students in a maternity clinic in Nepal. And um, I love it for several reasons. One, it shows the diversity of the class. Another in that it shows that to be successful in problem solving in healthcare, the critical first step is listening carefully, being a good listener going to where the problem exists. You can't solve the problem unless you really know who the people are that are gonna be using the product, benefiting from the product, um, paying for the product, all those things you have to be really cognizant of and, and in the environment in which the product will be used. So this is a maternity clinic in Nepal. This woman seated here is a midwife who works there and manages the facility. And uh, these are four of our students. You can see in the background the ways and tools that she's using and her colleagues are using to manage the clinic. So all of those are hints at what would work, what wouldn't work in that environment, which are critical to successful design.
So in our definition that we're using to design something is to create a good solution to a problem. So my first job at J&J was at Ethicon Endosurgery in Cincinnati, and we designed things like this. This is a, a cutter stapler for, for, um, for usually used for lap coli and other abdominal surgeries. And, um, and it's an amazing device. It, it allows a doctor, to, a surgeon to take out your gallbladder through tiny incisions as opposed to huge incisions. It's very effective. It also looks really nice too. I mean, it's an attractive piece of hardware, but, um, but that was not the objective. It's really functional. Um, now things can look really cool, but actually be really lousy design. And I apologize if any of you have one of these you purchased for $60 at William Sonoma, but it's a fruit juicer, but it's like the worst fruit juicer in the world. If you like, you'll have fruit juice all over your countertop if you try to use this, um, but it looks really cool. You got to admit, but it's not a good solution to the problem. And poor design could be not functional, not effective, not safe, not usable, or not affordable, or not buildable in the sense of menu. It's not designed to be manufacturable on a large, large scale or not sustainable. Increasingly, this is a big deal, especially European um, Union has instituted some regulations saying medical devices have to, you know, especially disposables, they have to figure out a way to minimize that, that whole um, uh, sustainability aspect of their products. And, or it's not, or it's just not better than what's already out there. The bottom line is it's not bringing real value to other people and it's not a good use of our time and our creativity. It's really a travesty. So, it's, so those are things we want to avoid. Good design, on the other hand, are, these are pictures from projects that CBIT students have done over the years. I'll describe them more in detail later, but good design improves health, of course, lowers pain, automates something that's done manually, makes things that are high, require high skill, require lower skill, de-skilling, improves cost, improves training, perhaps. One of these is a training tool. For, pacing, for placing pacemaker leads in the heart, um, or lowers risk, or reduces waste, or increases access to care, or teaches, teaches um, like caregivers, or teaches parents how to detect signs of their baby might have sepsis or something, or in, and empower people, empower people to um, take more uh, control over their health care in an informed manner. These are all ways that innovation and design can really improve things. You know, Paul Yock has this great quote that I love. He's the head of Stanford's biodesign program, the founder of the program, and a great mentor for our program. He said, the unsung hero of innovation is choosing the right problem to solve. And, um, and the, the, these problems could be in diagnosis, in planning, in providing the care needed, in maintaining care over time. There's many other aspects of care besides the acute, the cool phase when the surgery is happening or the care is delivered, you know, before and after that phase that are really impactful in care. And, and um, over the course of the year, our students spend one third of their time just defining what the problem is that they're going to be addressing. And I'll say a little bit more about how that's done. Now, in the medical device innovation field, there's a hundred things you have to take care of. It's like boiling the ocean. And there's just, it's too much for a startup almost, unless you have million, tens of millions of dollars thrown at you. It's really difficult to cover all these. These are just examples of things. We did a little brainstorming with the students that came up with a list. There's just a hundred things you have to think about. And, um, and the question is, how can you do that? Especially how can you do it if you're not funded like a like a J and J R and D team or like a like a you know a, a, a well-funded uh, new venture and the approach we take and we we this is something that came out of ethicon endosurgery is to really start by simplifying this into four thematic areas clinical issues and concerns and activities commercial or business concerns issues activities technical and design related activities and organizational and strategic issues so you take all those hundreds of things and kind of bucket them under these four buckets. That's step one. Then the question is, where are you going to start and how much time should you spend on each? So typically in academia, this is like my story, my PhD, my advisor at UT Austin said, um, Yusuf, you can work on whatever the hell you want to work on, but it better end up using a laser as the solution. 
So we spent a lot of time working on laser-based spectroscopy-based techniques for diagnosing disease. And, um, and typically, we in nerdy engineers spend a lot of time on the technical side and neglect these other three quadrants. And what happened, for example, in my story, PhD, is that I developed a technique for, for um, or we in the lab developed a technique for that could possibly replace the pap smear with a 90 plus sensitivity and specificity versus the pap smear now, which is like 70 or 60 plus. It's not that big, not that good. Um, but it required this $100,000 UV laser and three technicians to actually work. And um, guess what? We were successful technically, but it was a failure in all other aspects. It never helped anybody, never saved anybody's lives. In the corner of the clinic at MD Anderson, where we we're doing our work, there was a box that someone had developed and it was, all it did was make, take this, the cervical sample and make a stamp it like a French press onto a little microscope slide to make a nice thin monolayer of cells to make it easier to read the slide. It didn't disrupt the way the pathologist handled the slide. It didn't cost much more than the existing cost structure. And 90% of pap smears today use that device it's called the thin prep. It's an amazing device, saves, saves a lot of lives. Huge financial gain, big success. I think the company was acquired for three hundred million dollars, um, whereas our laser thing didn't go anywhere. So of course that approach doesn't is not a wise approach. The approach for like the Stanford Biodesign Program, which is a much wiser approach, is to first understand the clinical problem and all the parameters and constraints imposed by the clinical reality. Once you've understood that, then design your solution. And once you have that designed, then design a method to take it to market and, and get it to market and then put together a team. So you kind of follow this linear pathway here. Um, this is a much more intelligent and mature way to do things. But there is inherent a little bit of, a, of, an, of, a, of, a, of a, an arrogance here. And that is, you're assuming that at this point, you've understood the clinical problem completely, and then you design a solution. But that's not really true. I mean, at, at, at J and J, we had like, we, we would talk to a lot of folks up at Cleveland Clinic and, and they would come down, some KOL would come down and say, I really need X. And we do interviews with the KOLs and then we would spend millions of dollars and build a prototype show to this guy. And he would say, oh, you know, now that I see it, I don't really need that. That's not really what I need, I need this. So you can't assume you, even if you try, you can't assume you fully understood the problem until you try to solve the problem. It's kind of like hiking in the mountains where you can see the 10 steps ahead of you, but not farther. And, but until you take those 10 steps, you're not gonna see the next 10 steps. So you really need to take an, a, a different approach and not assume that you fully understood the problem before you try to solve it. So an iterative approach makes a lot more sense. You start of course with a clinical understanding and then try to understand what are some of the commercial parameters around that? Like how much are people willing to pay to solve this problem. This is before you even have any idea how you're gonna solve the problem. And what sort of risk profile would start to pop up you know, in solving this problem before you even know how to solve it? And then based on those constraints, you start to do some initial thinking about how to solve it, some brainstorming, et cetera. And then you try to put together a team and resources that make sense to solve the problem. But then you go back with your initial brainstorming ideas to the clinic and and get some more refinement on that and it's a, you just keep going. So that's the approach we take. So think of it as a space, a two dimensional space that you must fill out where the center is time zero and dollar zero. And the farther you go out, you're spending more time and money on this issue. And you eventually have to fill up the whole space to cover all those hundreds of different topics. But what approach can you take if you're in a frugal manner that doesn't require a $10 million, $20 million investment in a startup? And the approach we take is this, is that you, you do a little bit in each of these. And then you stop and you see, does this make sense? And you look at hundreds of needs, all sorts of things. And you, you, do that for, you do that kind of assessment for a lot of different needs. On the clinical side, you say, does this problem really causing significant harm to patients? Does the intuition of doctors tell you that this should be solvable? Are the existing solutions failing or inadequate? Like how much are people willing to pay to solve the problem on the commercial side, et cetera. So you have four fold filter 
for each of the needs, just in picking which of the needs you're going to solve, and make sure it's a worthy problem to solve from all four of these perspectives. And of course, in real life, our teams go through a really detailed um, analysis under each of the four clinical, business, technical, strategic. They define all the some sub factors within each of those. They define a scale from negative one to five for each of those factors. And then they judge different, like these are six different needs and they assess the needs based on these different factors. So this is before there's any solution being discussed at all. And then the key is that for each of the needs, you make sure that it makes sense from all these perspectives. And it could make sense from, it could be fantastic like my PhD project from a technical perspective and from a clinical perspective, but not make sense at all from a commercial perspective or organizationally it may not make sense. And you'll have maybe a lot of these and then you'll filter them down and choose the ones that make sense from all these perspectives. And then once those top needs are chosen, then you subdivide the overall need into sub needs. Like, um, just pick a, an example, like a, a chair does multiple things. And each of those things the chair does for you, um, you, you can break that down as a separate sub need and a separate brainstorming around how to solve that. And then looking at your solutions, you can also do the same. You can assess each of those solutions and you can break it down. We, we go through a very intricate process here, but you don't need to do it conceptually. The key is just that when you're assessing your solutions, you also use a similar rubric to assess them and that you make sure the, the solutions that you're choosing, you filter them based on a filter like this. And again, you'd have um, many of these solutions. Some will make sense from some perspectives and not and from others. You may combine solutions that make sense from some and others and then into your ideal solution that makes sense from all four perspectives. And of course, when we're talking about solutions, it doesn't have to be necessarily a new device or tool or gadget. I would say when we started in 2009, 2010 academic year, um, we were really focused on gadgets and devices. But since then, our eyes have been opened that there's all sorts of ways to, we try to be a little bit more open-minded and say, we're not wedded to proving how great of an engineer we are, how great engineers we are. We're not wedded to making money. We're not wedded to, to um, showing off our technical skills. We're just really passionate about solving the problem and helping the people suffering from that problem. And once you take that perspective, then your eyes are open to a lot of different ways to help solve the problem, including apps and even educational programs. Like one of our teams, their, their solution there was a design of a board game for midwives to learn how to make a decision about whether the patient should go for a C-section or go for a regular delivery in a, quick, in a, in a, in a rural clinic. Um, or it could be a new step-by-step -step process. And it doesn't have to be new as in totally new. It could just be a using or modifying an existing app or solution for something else or combining these. Again, the goal is not to, to prove your technical chops. The goal is to, um, is to solve the problem. So that's the approach is this iterative approach as you build out, building on previous um, efforts. So for example, if one of these pizza slices, let's take this one right here, is regulatory if issues. The first instance, the team, you're not going to go whole hog in the first iteration and hire a regulatory expert and spend days and days assessing this when it's just an early prototype that's going to change a lot by the time you get to any sort of regulatory submission. The key is you understand early on this little area under the curve here, which is like how do regulators look at new solutions. They look at it from a risk-based approach and you teach them how to assess the risk. The second iteration in our program, students talk to regulatory consultants for maybe an hour each team. The third iteration, the team actually does a mock pre-sub down at the FDA. And we have a law firm here that reviews like, like a full review of their submission, their pre-sub submission. So gradually over time, the area under the curve is increasing and it's building on the previous knowledge. For example, the first iteration on the clinical side, the, the students may talk to one or two clinicians, and then they'll do like an i thing where they'll interview a bunch of clin people, clinicians and other caregivers, healthcare professionals in that field. 
And then in the, in the broader iteration, they'll start to do like some clinical studies, et cetera, on the design and prototyping and organization may start out with a small team, gradually build out an advisory committee, gradually bring on others and et cetera. Small grants that the center provides, then going to awards and investment leading to like a, like, you know, grants and other investment in the, in the team. So that's the gist of it. It's not something really that profound. The idea is that when student asks you, like, when should I think of, when should I start thinking about regulatory affairs? My answer is always now. When should I start thinking about reimbursement? The answer is now. When should I start thinking about IP? The answer is now. But the question, the answer, but the question is not when, the question is to what depth? How do you put the do in due diligence? How do you make sure that you do an appropriate level of work on each of the important factors that could kill your project in the future if you neglect them to pay attention to them but you don't go overboard in it you do a little bit of work on all of these topics that's important and then you stop and you assess and if it makes sense then you do a little bit more and a little bit more by the way we also do the same for global health innovation projects these are some of the countries these are all the countries that we've been to for our different projects um, and the, the, the purpose there was this. We, um, we felt like if we want to train leaders in med tech innovation, they have to know how to develop solutions that don't just work in the wealthy Johns Hopkins or, or University of Pittsburgh hospitals. They have to work everywhere in the world, in places where resources are lower for multiple reasons. One, um, because our moral imperative is to provide more accessible care. Another is that for medtech industry, the double digit growth in our industry is in developing countries and they can't afford the kind of things we develop for here. So they have to learn. They have to be designed to be inherently lower cost, more frugal solutions. So that's one reason why we incorporated this in the program. So each team of students works on a US or developed world project and then a global health or low cost LMIC kind of project. And they do both. So here are some examples. Um, this one is a this one at the top. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's a um, it's a way to de-skill ultrasound. So ultrasound is requires you know sonographer. It's really hard to read the images. And um, if you were Jeff Bezos and you had a free flap procedure and the success of the procedure depended on the anastomoses right here in these two vessels, you would probably have an ultrasonographer constantly monitoring those blood flow in those vessels day and night. And as soon as there were signs of constriction, you would, the doctor would come in and make sure those vessels flow. So this procedure here, this flap would, would, um, would stay viable. So this free flap procedure is done during plastic surgery reconstruction, like for breast reconstruction, facial reconstruction, We'll take tissue from someplace else and put it there. And the whole success depends on this, these, this small anastomosis here. But most people can't afford it. Maybe the, uh, an ultrasonographer can come by once a day to monitor the flow. And usually nurses wait until there's something weird going on with the tissue starts to change color. And by then it's almost too late. That's a mad scramble to get the tissue healthy again. And or also, also have to redo the procedure. It never works as well the second time. So the team, which included engineers and a plastic surgeon, spent a year and they developed. If you see this little piece of plastic here, this diamond-shaped thing, that was their innovation. It's a little piece of biodegradable plastic that costs like ten cents to make. And when the surgeon when the surgeon does the surgery, he places this right under that anastomosis, not touching it. So the FDA doesn't have to worry about damage to the anastomosis or the vessels from this implant. It's separate from the implant, but it's in a specific location with respect to the implant. So then a chimpanzee could pick up this transducer, move it around randomly on the surface in the general area. The software will automatically detect this shape and know where it is and, and report the blood flow. So you're de-skilling something which is really complicated in a very simple way. And the company called Sonovex is doing really well. This 10 cent piece of plastic can sell for like hundreds of dollars if you look at the reimbursement um, of the value it's creating. 
Here's another training tool I talked about, um, how to teach, um, this is for the Indian market, for temporary pacing, how to place a pa temporary pacing lead. And uh, the, basically it simulates the EKG signal from putting in the lead tip in different places so that the person placing the lead will learn how to put it in the right place. Here's another one, a very complex GI procedure we worked on with Boston Scientific. And the goal was, you know, getting this guide wire up into the common bile duct and not going into the wrong channel, which is the pancreatic duct, which if you do mess with, will create all sorts of, of complications like pancreatitis, et cetera. So the best skilled GI guys can, through the scope, get this, 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 this wire up here. And um, so the challenge given to us by Boston Sci was, can you de-skill this? Can you make it easier to do? And the team came up with some great ideas that are licensed by Boston Sci. Here's another one. Um, how do you fix the problem of chronic wounds? I mean, help man the management of chronic wounds. And as you know, these things are measured often with a straight edge. Measurement error is pretty high. Inconsistency between nurses is high. And there's a huge amount of money riding on this measurement in terms of reimbursement and what cost the hospital has to eat and what cost the hospital, hospital can charge for. So this was the challenge given to the team. And they came up with a tool called tissue analytics and basically uses a cell phone camera, take a picture of the wound and measures the wound size and reports that. Um, can anyone on the call besides the faculty say how they were able to calibrate for changes in the distance between the camera and the phone and changes in angle and changes in illumination. Because if you don't have that calibration, you won't be able to make an accurate less than 5% measurement. You can chat, put it in the chat for five points. Right, Professor Perlman, five extra points. Exactly. All right, nobody? Any of the faculty? Was that green dot right there have anything to do with it? Yes, yes, perfect. So, so the students were looking at LIDAR. I'm not kidding, they're, they're engineers, right? So they're looking at LIDAR, they're looking at ultrasound, they're looking at all different weird ways of like multiple cameras, et cetera, to make this, to correct for these factors. So I sent them to the office supply store to buy a box of these thousand, a thousand of these green dots where you normally put on like files, folders. And because it's the same printing, it has the same color, ink, same size, and it tells you the angle because you'll get an oval instead of a circle. It tells you the distance based on the size of the circle. And it tells you illumination because that green dot will change color slightly depending on, on the spectrum of the illumination. And because of that, they were able to get really accurate size measurement, but also they were able to do a crude characterization of the wound itself as well, like what parts are necrotic and what parts are healthy, et cetera. This has been very successful. It spun out as a company called Tissue Analytics and was acquired last year um, into another medical device company. The hardest part of this project was not this part. The hardest part of this project that made them really successful was that they wrap it in through their interviews with the stakeholders. They discovered from nurses and doctors that keeping the records and billing and keeping track of all this was the hardest part. So they integrated very quickly, they integrated with the Epic system here and that was their, that made them very successful. And they never would have even focused on that if they just focused on the science and the technology. Here's another successful spin out called IntelliHealth. It basically provides an app that guides a rural telemedicine clinic worker to go through the steps of doing a really good job of capturing a, a history of the patient, the medical history of the patient in a very careful manner. And the team that developed this, one of our faculty here and some students, one of them a PhD student who just finished her PhD a couple of weeks ago, this was her dissertation. And they took, they went through textbooks and, and interviews and they captured a bunch of rules for how the best, you know, family practitioners, internal medicine practitioners, you know, your family, your, your, your first doctor, how, he or she does a good job of capturing what's really wrong, what information is critical to understanding what's wrong with this patient and, and determining what the best care for this patient is. And 
I don't know about you all, but I've never found doctors really good at that. They often get this tunnel vision where they'll assume something, you know, like, like if you're overweight, they'll, you know, and you have knee pain, they'll assume it's just because of that. If you're, you know, whatever, you know, there are all these biases that, that come in and they have, the, you know, this preconceived notions, but the app guides the caregiver to ask certain questions. Questions will pop up and then based on the patient response, additional questions will pop up. And then all this information will be captured in a very efficient manner and transmitted on a 2G signal to a doctor to make the final diagnosis. But then it'll be codified in a way that makes it really easy for the, clinic, the doctor to make a really quick, um, accurate um, diagnosis. And they may order like, oh, also take the blood pressure. The software will say, take the blood pressure or take this measurement as well. So this company is very successful. It just passed the million dollar revenue mark. It has 70 employees in India and it's working really well. And I invite you to go to their websites, intellihealth.org. The, the, the PhD student, by the way, is also, she's not only during her PhD, she also helped to co-found the company and is CEO of the company as well. Really amazing. So we've done this in India as well and China. A lot of time talking to doctors and stakeholders and, um, and really understanding what's going on. Um, a funny story, we were in a hospital in Shanghai and there was a poster on the wall and it had a picture of a guy with a cleave meat cleaver chasing the doctor. And I asked one of my students who can read Mandarin and she said, the sign says, if you're upset with your doctor, don't kill the doctor, come to this office, contact our office and we will resolve the conflict you know, with you. And we were working on a project with pacemakers and this clued us into this idea that one of the big reasons why people in China who need pacemakers don't get pacemakers is because they don't trust their doctors. When the doctor said you need a pacemaker, the first reaction the family will have is, how much money are you gonna make from this thing? You know, so the issue of trust was critical to solving this problem. So the design was a solution that would build trust and build the mental connection between the symptoms the patient was having and this idea of bradycardia and the need for a pacemaker. And that came out of discussions across different parts of China. Sorry, I'll try to speed up. We've had several spin outs from, from the, the program doing fairly well. Overall, over 12 months, the program really is about one third um, really identifying between, let's say, June when the students arrive through the end of middle of the fall semester, really identifying that one target that they're going to go after. And they spend a lot of time in clinical immersion here at Hopkins and then immersion overseas for their global project, weekly meetings to discuss what they're seeing and refining it down to one need. The second third from, let's say, the winter all the way through the the, the intercession and the beginning of the spring semester, they look at a wide range of concepts and narrow it down to one or two top solutions. They all start to put together their business plan. And then by the end of May, they have the, they fully fleshed out the, the, you know, not fully, but they've done that first, you know, couple of iterations in all four of those quadrants. They have a solid business plan. Um, they just came back from the Stu Clark business plan competition. They won second and third place in the elevator pitch competition. So they're, they're doing pretty well on the business side as well. So that's the gist of the program. It's really a team-based approach to go through all of these together as a team with students and clinicians and faculty working together. I'll stop there. I think I'm a little bit over the 30 minute mark. Thanks. That was um, that was a great overview of what you've done there. I wonder, just open it up to questions from the audience. It, it sounds it's really great. Out, is that lawnmower making too much noise out there? Should I turn, close the window? It's okay. No, I think it's okay. Yeah. All right. But this uh, it, the program sounds really great. I wonder what is um, what's the success rate like? Of first of all finding a problem that's worth working on. And then from there, you know, finding a, a, a novel solution. You know, it's, it's a good question. What is the success rate? Because we, everyone ends up with something, right? right? But the question is, is it a really good one? 
but did they come up with something that's really worth working on? I mean, the way we, we look at it is that there are different failure modes. The failure mode of choosing a not a worthy problem is something we really take to heart and we try not to let happen. Mm -hmm. So we really want to make sure that the problem they end up choosing to work on is something that really makes sense from all of those perspectives we talked about. Um, so that's, 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 um, that's something that we try not to let happen. So if they don't have anything good, we have, of course, a lot of project, a lot of needs that we could, we could suggest to them. And we kind of steer them in the direction of things we think will be, will be most, you know, exciting and doable. But, you know, I would say it's, it should be 100%. I mean, it should not fail in terms of choosing the right problem to work on. Now, they may never come up with something worthy as a solution because you can't force creativity. Right. But at least they're working on something that was worth working on. So I rarely, I don't think we've ever had a project where you look at it after the fact and say, that's kind of lame. They shouldn't have been working on that. That's not really worth solving. Or the existing solutions are already good enough and it's not really worth doing. Do you ever find that you don't have the right team members with the right knowledge and expertise? Yes, yes. So because, you know, that's the big difference uh, between this model and the ac traditional academic grad school model. Because in the grad school model, the, because you're focused, you have a specific limited technology domain that the lab is doing, then you choose grad students who can help with that. And, and the faculty knows all about that. But the solutions that teams are working on, 90% of the time, I have no, it's not in my area of biophotonics. Mm -hmm. And so, what, we're, what we do is we bring in expertise from other departments and other schools and other faculty to help them. So the team in this, you know, that I showed in that picture, that's the core team. But the core team is, is mentored by an advisory committee. So each team has an advisory committee, which includes clinical experts in the clinical domain that they focused on, technical experts in the technology domain they're focused on. Like if they focused on ultrasound, then they have a bunch of ultrasound people on there and business experts. I see. Other questions? Yeah, I can, uh, I can lean in with a question. Uh, first, let me thank Dr. Uh, Yazdi for your presentation and sharing with us this uh, really cool and forward-looking approach you're using there in your, uh, in your institution. Um, how do you, you know, I'm, I'm a regulatory lawyer, uh, by training and, and I, you know, one of the functions I serve with the group that you're speaking with is just trying to stay on top of the regulatory changes. Uh, John's probably share with you. We're doing a lot of work in home care, uh, which is just about as rapidly emerging regulatory regime around a, uh, fast moving uh, area of the economy, as, as you could imagine. So how do you keep up with the regulatory changes over time and inform the teams? Um, you know, what's your mechanism for doing that? Uh, or do you have outside counsel doing that? What's the, what's the approach to making sure that the products, especially if they're going to be reimbursed by Medicare or Medicaid, um, you know, how do you keep up with the regulatory changes as fast paced as that seems to be? Well, that's a great question, and your and the program is very fortunate to have you um, because the, the answer to the question is we can't. It can only be done, and this is not only true for regulatory affairs, but also for reimbursement and a hundred other topics. We can't be experts in any of that, and we shouldn't be pretending to be experts. And I shouldn't be giving a lecture on regulatory affairs. I should bring in someone like yourself, and which that's exactly what we do. We bring in experts who are normally consultants in regulatory affairs to come in. We, we're, we're about 40 minutes away from White Oak, where the FDA headquarters is. So a lot of our alums work there, and we have some folks who can come up and volunteer their time to, to provide some feedback on regulatory issues. They also allow us to do a mock, like pre-sub meetings later in the spring. And we also have a company, a law firm here called Hogan Lavelle's, which you're familiar with. It does like the majority of, of, of um, more complex submissions in the U.S., and they pro bono every year provide like a couple of days worth of 
consulting time. So they'll go through each project, review their pre-sub submission, and um, and uh, and give feedback to the team on that. So we don't even pretend to try to keep up with that stuff. We bring in the guys who know it, who live and breathe it. And it's not just true for regulatory affairs, even for prototyping. Like, I know how to build optical stuff from circa 1990, but I've been, I haven't been out, I've been out of grad school for a long time. I probably wouldn't even know which end of the soldering iron is hot. Um, so it's really important to bring in the experts and let them be the advisors to the, to the students. It's expensive, but it, it's, 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 I think it's a yeah. I like the alignment of interest because as we know, the lawyers are not going to be doing that more than uh, likely out of the goodness of their hearts, but they probably see it as a business development opportunity as well. Yes, yes. Thanks very and it's much. Happened. And it's happened. Like the spin outs like Lysend, once they hit like a few million dollars in, 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 in investment, they hired Hogan Lovells to help them with their regulatory strategy. So it's hopefully a virtuous cycle. So um, one question we have, and I think this is you know, part of the reason that we, we started the seminar is to get faculty um, more engaged in technology development and tech transfer. And so I mean, you're, you started in industry and I think understand the value proposition, I think that academia has for industry and vice versa. And I wonder if you can sort of talk through that and how, for instance, you engage industry to help support and sponsor your, your tech development and vice versa, how you would sort of encourage faculty to get involved and engage industry to um, commercialize their products or even work on industry sponsored research. Yeah, great question, John. I, I mean, when I was at J&J headquarters, we tried to engage with academia, I would say 90% of the time, what faculty are working on is irrelevant to translation and commercialization. And when we would go to universities and say, wait a second, we have a list here of things that our customers and our doctors and nurses are desperately calling out for. And we wish you would focus on these problems and helping solve those problems. Because we can tell you, if you solve them, there's an outstretched hand ready to license it in and develop it. And the faculty would say, who the hell are you to tell me what to work on? I mean, I'm Professor so-and-so at Rutgers or Princeton, and, you know, we, I know what I'm doing, you know. So the, the, the culture and the mindset was very different. I'm not saying that's ubiquitous, but even in engineering, at biomedical engineering, at Johns Hopkins University, I remember we were doing a strategic plan of like six, seven years ago, and I interviewed almost every faculty member on where they are on the spectrum of interest in translation versus basic science, and most of the folks were on the basic science side. So the, the proper approach starts with this notion that at least part of every faculty's portfolio should be something that's relevant to translation and commercialization. It doesn't have to be their main thing, but I think it's really beneficial. And something that Tom Scalak was telling me when we set up the culture program there at, at the University of Virginia was that having some dimension of your research you know, portfolio as a faculty member that's focused on this translation and commercialization angle really helps your basic science work as well. It helps your grantsmanship for sure, because you start to learn the language of, of, of this and, and vice versa. So I would say this first step is that academia needs to, there needs to be a shift in culture. Now, old organizations like yours and ours, it's kind of hard if you're successful to get a change in culture. There was a president at Hopkins who, told one of our clinicians who was interested in commercialization that, listen, you're either on this side of the street or you're on that side of the street. You can't be in the middle of the street. You're either on the academic side or the commercial side. You know, you can't do both. And that was when I got here. But now the culture has shifted. Now there's enough success stories that more and more clinicians and more and more faculty are interested in doing this sort of activity. Second thing is you have to understand what the mindset of industry and what a, what a manager, like a VP of R&D, what do they care about? What are they being held accountable for? I think that people at the VP and director level are often the most stressed out people in any corporation. They're under a lot of stress to deliver. And if you could help them, they, would, they, have, they have plenty of money, but if you could help them, they will love you and they will fund you. 
but you have to be open-minded and be able to follow your lead sometimes. So we do, our projects usually have some remit for a team that's sponsored by a company. Like this one with Boston Sci, it was the GI division in Boston Sci came to us and said, there's this complex procedure. If we can get more people to do the procedure, we can sell more of these products, but the project, the procedure is too complicated. Figure out a way to solve, to reduce that complexity. That was very narrow. And we were a little bit hesitant to take it on because the question is, is there enough scope within that narrow domain for the students to do this process, this innovation process? And we decided also because Boston Sci is giving us some money that we're gonna say yes. It's kind of hard to, for academics to say no to money. But, but um, so we said yes. Now, in some cases like the Medtronic project, it was, I mean, it was from the CEO of Medtronic, Omar Ishrak. He said, I want you to go to India and find out why people who need pacemakers are not getting pacemakers. And don't tell me it's because they're too expensive. I already know that part of the story. And that's where all these products, in fact, IntelliHealth came out of that because there was a, it was determined that in these rural clinics, people who have conditions like bradycardia are not getting diagnosed until they waste a lot of time and money. And so you need an app to help people get that accurate diagnosis. So I would say being flexible and open-minded, sitting down with the, with the corporate partners and asking them, what can we do to help you? And then seeing if you can find something that makes sense for you and your mission as an academic institution that overlaps with their mission as the steward of some money and resources in a corporation. Great, thanks. Sure. Other, other questions? Did, uh, did Johns Hopkins do anything to change their IP policy or incentive system for faculty to help this happen in work, being successful working with industry? I don't think they've made any changes since I got here. I think it's like, I think faculty get like a third of their royalties. And, um, and uh, it's still, I would say, it's still not a rosy relationship between faculty and the tech transfer office. Right. They've done a lot of great things and create a lot of support and infrastructure, but I don't know why, why, even before I came to Hopkins, it's always seemed to be that the tech transfer office was always struggling in being a good, you know, providing good service in this regard. So I think faculty get like a third. At UT in, in, in Texas, I have some patents out of UT, it's 50% goes directly to the inventors. But here's like a third and the lab gets some and the, the department gets some and the dean gets some and the president's office gets some. It's like everyone, you know, there's a, you know, there's like all these outstretched hands ready to take a piece of the action. You know, and it's not very good for innovation, but. Yeah, Pitt's wrestling with that right now. Trying yeah, to the new I think policy. it's short-sighted. I mean, the, the value, reputational value to Pitt or Hopkins of having these spin outs, having these successful student, in, you, know, you know, innovation or faculty innovation turning into companies and real products is just phenomenal. It's worth more than a few thousand here and a few thousand there in royalties. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very good. Cool. Well, what's that? I was going to say, but it's a struggle. I mean, Hopkins has done phenomenally. In, they've been a great improvement in the last in the years I've been here. I'm, I'm sure it's the same across the board. Everyone now, the culture is shifting, I think, across the board. But there's still a long way to go before faculty really feel like they're incentivized. Even things like promotion and recognition for promotion, things like patents are, are, are still being debated after all this time of whether, whether you know, someone has 200, you know, page CV published papers that the impact should be measured just based on impact factor of citations, as opposed to impact on lives saved and and resources saved in healthcare. It's 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 really weird. I mean, anyone outside of academia hearing that that's how you measure impact, it sounds a little bit um, self centered. I really like your idea of requiring a translation part of a portfolio. You know, a promotion portfolio, for example. Yeah. Any other final questions? I'll ask one last one. Thank you, Dr. Yazdi, for the talk. 
I think to your last point, there's some evidence that suggests that minority faculty or even women, you know, might feel even less incentivized because of this like promotion and tenure problem. And I'm wondering if you think that there might be particular strategies to help diversify this area. Gosh, I think there's no one strategy that can help because the problem is so broad and ubiquitous and ingrained in our act in higher ed. What we try to do is is really um, make sure we have a very representative class in the class itself and that we have a very representative group of mentors. So we do this like town hall at the end of every year with Dr. Acharya, the, the, the director of the graduate program. We sit down with all the students and hear their complaints about the year, like what did they like, what did they not like. And a couple of years ago, one of the students, a couple of students, women students in the program said, you know, you bring in all these outside mentors, but none of them are women. We have a lot of young women who are early in their career, but nobody like a VP level people or executive level people who can be role models. And because there's this glass ceiling and there's a lot of, you know, like a good old boys club in the executive suites and a lot of these corporations. So we made a concerted effort. In fact, we turned it into a podcast um, called Winning Health. And they interviewed a series of, of, of women leaders in med tech. And it's a fascinating discussion, really amazing stuff. And advice to, to women in getting into med tech and managing the corporate life and managing all these things that they're gonna be facing. It's really a wonderful series and inspirational, I think, and providing some good role models. Same thing for your own candidates, et cetera. So we're trying, but I don't think there's an easy, like quick solution to it. It's not just recruitment or this and that, because um, if you recruit, for example, we, you know, I, I attended BMES, there was a session on black women in, in biomedical engineering. And the number one th thing I learned from sitting in the back of that room and listening was that the sense of isolation that minority students have in the program. And it's really critical to deal with that. And it's really important. But I think in our field of work, which is about problem solving, if you don't have diversity, you don't have good design. It's just, you know, basic design. You need a diversity of opinions and perspectives and life experiences in order to have a, a good design. Otherwise, you're going to be narrow and it's going to fail. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank you again for the talk um, and the questions. It's been, I think, insightful for a lot of us and great to um, be refreshed on the uh, learning about the success that you've had at, at Johns Hopkins and your program. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really a treat. Thank you. Thank you for your great questions.